Hello and welcome. A democratic process has become a regular feature in African politics in recent decades, where elections are often free but rarely fair, visibly peaceful but arguably credible. From Rwanda to Kenya, the litmus test of democracy continues in parts of Africa following Angola's historic election, kick-starting the beginning of a new political era in the country. This is Africa This Week and I'm your guide, Fadisha Lashotingwa. We start off the day with Earlier in the Week. Welcome on board. On Monday, the employees of the Sierra Leonean government started registering people affected by the March slide, which killed more than 400 people. The lists, which contains detailed information on the people affected, will be given to aid organizations to provide survivors with support. The government has cottoned off the disaster site as its officials said that preventing the spread of diseases was top priority. What we are doing is to verify all those who are initially registered and um, we are trying to, uh, to harmonize all the list of registrants. Uh, initially, a lot of groups had started taking names of uh, survivors, victims, and so many, many lists. So this activity here today is intended to help harmonize and make sure that we, we know who the actual victims are. We haven't got enough um, um, resources coming yet because it's an ongoing thing. They've got some, some organization have um, offered some medication, welfare, also um, food, supplies, but it's not enough. We still need more to come in because as you can see, there's, there's, there's a multitude of survivors here as well. The Rwandan president, Paul Kagame, announced on Tuesday that the country was willing to deepen diplomatic cooperation in all areas with China and push bilateral relations to a new level. Kagame made the remarks when he met Liu Jiafong, the special envoy of Chinese president Xi Jinping in the Rwandan capital, Kigali. Kagame, who has been sworn in for a third term, thanked Xi for sending the special envoy to attend his inauguration ceremony and asked the envoy to convey his gratitude and regards. South Africa has adjusted rules guiding mining activities in the country, giving more room to ownership of mines by the black population. The new rules give as much as 30% mine ownership to the blacks. The action has polarized the sector, creating frictions amongst operators. The government says that the new rules will address inequality in the economy. Mining companies are opposed to the new guidelines, saying that the sector will be destroyed. Wednesday was the International Day for the Remembrance of Slave Trade and its Abolition. It was marked to give people a chance to reflect on the causes and the consequences of slave trade. Pirates, yes, they rob I, sold I to the merchant ships. Badagri is a coastal town and local government area in Lagos State, Nigeria. It was founded in the early 15th century on a lagoon off the Gulf of Guinea. Then, its inhabitants lived along the coast of Berefu, which later gave birth to the town. It is bordered on the south by the Gulf of Guinea and surrounded by creeks, islands and a lake. Badagri is a few kilometers from Seme, a border town to the Republic of Benin. The town subsists largely on fishing and agriculture and maintains a small museum of slavery. Its protected harbor led to the town becoming a key port in the export of slaves to the Americas in the 1500s. It was also a big departure point for slaves headed for Haiti. Every part of Badagri has an interesting historic twist to it. The town showcases an exciting blend of incredible art, momentous history and amazing town lifestyle. This island played a major role in the history of the contact between Nigeria, Europe and the Americas. It was a major slave outpost and market during the centuries of slave trade. And this point is the route of the journey to a known destination. This particular part, we call it the slave route. Slaves worked on this particular route for about 300 years. 
When you walk on this route, you are making history. And as you walk on the route, you begin to imagine the experiences of the ancestors. The chains, sunlight will equally make it very, very hot. So the chains were hot, the sun is very hot, and they're not putting on any shoes. And as they are walking on the slave route, one of them may fall and die. If such happen, if they have enough time, they will unchain another slave who will dig the ground to bury such a person. Between the early 1500 and 1787, no fewer than 550,000 African slaves passed through this island to America, Europe, South Africa, and the Caribbean. The 400 years of Pan-Atlantic slave trade constitutes the darkest history of mankind. The infamous slave trade might have ended, but as the Jamaican reggae legend Bob Marley said, there were no chains around the feet of Africans. But Africans are still not free. Well, Chad became the latest country to cut ties with Qatar on Wednesday after closing the Qatari embassy in Indamina and gave its staff 10 days to leave. Chad is accusing Doha of plans to destabilize its country via Libya. Chad, Mauritania and Senegal all recalled their ambassadors from Qatar in June. They acted after Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, the UAE, Bahrain, Yemen and Egypt broke off diplomatic and trade ties with Qatar, accusing it of supporting Islamist extremists. On Thursday, Zimbabwe's main opposition party, the Movement for Democratic Change, the MDC, expressed displeasure over the government's decision to declare a public holiday in honor of President Mugabe's birthday. The party's spokesman, Oberi Gutu, describes the move as an insult to Zimbabweans. According to him, the MDC believes in building strong institutions rather than strong personalities. Last week, Zimbabwe declared Mugabe's birthday on February the 21st a national holiday, honoring the veteran politician who opponents accuse of brutal repression and devastating the economy. Mugabe has been in power since 1980, when the country gained its independence from Britain. And there was a minor snub for the U.S. delegation scheduled to meet Egyptian Foreign Minister Sameh Shukri as Cairo protested against a U.S. decision to withhold some military aid. A delegation including presidential adviser Jared Kushner arrived at Cairo on Thursday to discuss meetings on the Middle East peace process, but the meeting was dropped at the last hour. This was interpreted as Egypt's way of showing its displeasure for Washington withholding $96 million in aid and delaying another $195 million in military funding because of concerns over Cairo's human rights record. The decision came as a surprise as President Donald Trump had pledged strong ties with a key U.S. ally after they had deteriorated under Barack Obama. And more than 9 million Angolans cast their ballot in an election that marked the end of President Jose Eduardo dos Santos' 38 years in power and opening a new chapter in the nation's politics. Deciding to step down on health grounds, the outgoing president is said to have laid the groundwork for a hand-picked successor in the oil-rich country, where economic challenges and corruption are immediate concerns. International observers present during Angola's general election on Wednesday have praised the smooth running of the election process and have attributed success to the work of the National Electoral Commission. Some 1,200 international observers oversaw the election with 9.3 million Angolans eligible to cast their ballots at more than 12,000 polling stations across the nation during Wednesday's vote. The observers that spoke to the press were unanimous in recognizing the orderly manner in which voters went to the polling stations and recognized the civility of the voting process, hailing it as a sign of the strength of democracy in Angola. The outgoing head of state, Jose Eduardo dos Santos, headed to the polls to vote for a new president, as did his fellow countrymen in the capital of Luanda on Wednesday. It's Angola's fourth general election since its return to Malta, party democracy in 1992 and Dos Santos decided to step down and not run in this year's election after 38 years in power in the country.
Questions have been raised as to how much power Lorenko will have if he wins, given that veteran leader Jose Eduardo dos Santos, who is 74, who will continue to be the head of the ruling people's movement for the liberation of Angola, MPLA, and have potentially a sweeping say over decision-making. His daughter, Isabel, heads national oil producer, Sonango, and his son, Jose Filomeno, is in charge of the state investment fund. The MPLA is expected to remain in power, but with a reduced majority. Its support has waned due to widespread political corruption, though many Angolans remain loyal to the party that emerged victorious from 27 years of civil war in 2002. And with that, we have come to the end of earlier in the week. Up next is Digging Deep and that will be after the break. To stay with us. Welcome back to Africa This Week. Once upon a time in Africa, many centuries ago, when the pages of history were still scanty, kingdoms began to rise from the dark, empires grew towards light, and existence on motherland was largely rough, rugged, and raw. But with shackles in hands and chains in legs, the story suddenly took a different twist as Africans were shipped as slaves across the Atlantic and dehumanized in a strange land, leaving trails of tears, sweat and blood for about a staggering 400 years. Joining me in the studio to dig deep on Africa this week is Ifa Maberu, a historian, a scholar and a pan-Africanist. Welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining me. Yeah. Now, what are your thoughts on the International Remembrance Day on Slavery and its abolition marked by UNESCO? Well, I would say that um, we haven't really done much. Uh, perhaps let us really examine what it means by abolition, what it means by remembrance. Uh, you can't remember what is still living. It is impossible. And I think that is what UNESCO is doing. And I think that is hypocritical, really, because we have got to discuss um, what really, in natural fact, have we, have we abolished. Uh, to us, you know, slavery is still very much alive. And you see, slavery is still very much alive within the, concepts of, within the concept of its uh, physical presence and within the context of its mental presence. So you cannot speak about the 21st century or 2017 without not speaking about you know, the physical enslavement and the mental enslavement of the masses of black people. Why not let us address it? Why not let us address... How do you want us to address that? Address it will imply that we try as much as possible to destroy all of the first images, all of the first impressions that slavery has created. You see? Like, but, for instance, what does uh, For images? instance, now, you and I have to battle with the fact that you have a white door, you have a black door, and you call upon a black child to pick between the white door and the black door. That black child will never pick the black door. That black child will pick the white door. You and I have to discuss the meta, you know, damage. The slavery has done cost us as a people. And beyond that, of course, you and I have got to discuss the dividends that was made out of slavery, the dividends that Europe, that America today enjoys. Is it slavery that makes one choose a white door over a black door? Absolutely. You see, you understand that during the era of slavery, the um, enslavers did not just physically destroy our people. You know, to physically destroy a person, you must at first, mentally destroyed that person, and which was what was done. They took the mind, and of course, the body became theirs. Mm -hmm. You must understand that within the context of um, how Christianity was used, you know, against our people, mm -hmm. you know, as a religion, you know, to make them believe that, yes, being a slave is the right thing. The being a slave is what you must be. Mm -hmm. You know, this is what you have been ordained to be. You understand what I'm saying? So the enslavers, they, under, they understood the importance of what? The mind. They understood that once we've destroyed the mind, then the body will become ours. You understand what I'm saying? Now, which was what happened? So you and I cannot discuss slavery today without not discussing the first images that created the new slavery had, uh, had created for us as a people to be able to you know, emancipate ourselves fully. And you know, like you have it down there, Bob Marley you know, was saying that we have got to emancipate our because you know, Bob Marley made that statement in respect of the fact that he understood that metal slavery is uh, uh, the worst form of enslavement that any, 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 any can people get. can get. Yeah, well, can be it has that. remained a prevailing argument amongst scholars, you know, about the effects of slavery on the African world. How would you describe the economic and its um, political effects now? Well, its economic effects cannot be found uh, far-fetched because we are talking about 
a period of over 800 years. And you see, for us, when we're speaking of um, slavery, we're not just speaking of the Atlantic slavery, because many of us, we have got to understand that before the Europeans came, we had, I mean, I mean we're not just speaking about the Atlantic slavery, because many of us, we have got to understand that before the Atlantic, before the European, we had the Arabs. And that's why we put it within the context of 800 years of enslavement. And not 400. Not 400. Uh, when you examine that trajectory, you will see that, you, in other words, we're speaking about 800, 800 years of nothingness for us. You're speaking about 800 years of dissolution. You're speaking about 800 years of, you know, absolutely unproductive, you know, yes. era. You understand what I'm saying? And all of those unproductive era occurred because Europe, the Americas, we are enjoying you, the entirety of our wealth. We are enjoying the entirety of our labor, dividends of our labor and what have you. So really, you cannot speak about the current underdevelopment, the contemporary underdevelopment of uh, this continent or the masses of black people generally without not speaking about slavery. No, because we've never had, no group in history, in our history, no group in the history of uh, you know, woman, humankind had gone through half of what we went through as a people. And as such, it, is, it cannot be gainsaid, you know, really, that slavery is responsible for uh, uh, poverty, for inequality, you know, for mental slavery, like I said earlier on. And all of these things are tied to what? Economic dividends. And that is why it is so simple for you to go to Europe today and see uh, the entirety of their museums mm. and, of course, find African artifacts. Being there. Yeah, and you understand? And, you know, you have got to pay to watch all of these artifacts, to see all, I mean, to see all of these artifacts. Well, well they, they will be returning some of them, but let's No, I, I, don't be, I don't believe they will be returned <laughs> anytime well, soon. Well, what are your perspectives to the call for reparation to the victims of slavery amidst a wave of corrupt practices and bad governance in Africa? I think the question of reparation is a must. And you see, for us, when we speak about reparation, we are not just speaking of reparation within the content of uh, financial commitment. Mm. Of course, finance is important. Do you know why finance is important? During the era of slavery, you have this important, um, you have several... British you know, slave owning companies. Yeah. Um, till the 19th century, the one that existed most was the one that transcended to be called the United African Company. The United African Company historically was a slave owning company. UAC. But take a look at yeah, but take a look at US, take a look at um, USC today. USC still exists very much. I mean, USC is still very much alive. Mm. You and I cannot pick to a product 24 hours without not picking to a product being produced by USC. Indeed. And beyond USC, you have PZ, you have the Unilever Brothers and all of these were formerly slave owning companies. They wouldn't have made their words hadn't been for the enslavement of our ancestors. So it is we, we are within our right to demand for what? Reparation to demand that they pay us. But paying us, like I said earlier on, is just a means. It's not an end in itself. Mm. The end will be that we, as descendants of so-called slaves, work on our minds. Like I told you earlier on, the mind is the most important feature in the body. You know, once the mind of a person is destroyed, then forget about the body of the person. All right, beyond the Atlantic slave trade now, what do you think is responsible for the continuous modern-day slavery of human trafficking, child labor, and prostitution? Be, that's despite the abolition of slave trade that that itself speaks about um the economic system that we inherited you see you cannot discuss poverty you cannot discuss no, I, I, of course you, you i laid the claim to slavery the other time mm. but you see it is all um incidents that manifest themselves as a result of the system we took upon you, you understand what i'm saying really you cannot speak about on the development in this part of the world today without not speaking about capitalism as an economic system and of course without not speaking about imperialism without not speaking about the bad leadership that um, adorns the continent as we have it of today but importantly it is the economic system that we inherited you see we inherited the backward economic system known as capitalism an economic system that you know feeds itself from the exploitation of others we, we inherited an economic system that is so backward, you can call it a vampire-like economic system. An economic system that thrives from destroying the lives of the masses of the but people. But it's a so when, system that is that, still practiced. Yeah, exactly. So you would see that whenever the, whenever, whatever society that this system is being practiced, there will be this huge disparity between the rich and the poor. You understand what I'm saying? So you and I have got to discuss how to destroy this economic system that we inherited. It is an economic system that has nothing, no close relationship, no nexus with our social realities and conditions. All right. What are the lessons enshrined for Africa, home and abroad, in the chronological events of slavery? Oh, the lesson, you know, um, can be far-fetched in, in regards to what is still happening to date. I would say that for us as members of the black race, the lesson we can derive from the um, enslavement of our ancestors for over 800 years will be we understand it, the nature and character of others. We understand it, the 
nature and character of the perpetrators, the mm -hmm. Arabs and also the Europeans. The Europeans. Because many of us, we, are still, we still have this illusion that there's something good about these people. There's something good about the Arabs. There's something good about the Europeans. Recently, you know... And the Americans. And the Americans. Um, well, we call them Europeans because they are all white. You <laughs> understand? They stole the land you know, that they call America of today. You know, look at the recent happenings in U.S. for instance, the United Snakes of America, you know, the killings, I mean, the um, taking down of the statues of you know, the Confederate... Uh, um, uh, exactly. You would see that all of these things illuminate the fact that white people haven't changed a bit. We thought they've changed, but Indeed they have not. they haven't. And that's why we are saying part of the reparation demand will, always, will also be that they, give, they, you know, they come up with an apology. But they've never done that. You see, they, they don't come up with an apology for the Jewish. You know, the Jews, they got, they got their own reparation. The Germans, During the Nazis. Exactly. The, the Japanese, when Hiroshima and Nagasaki was bombed, mm. you know, the Americans had to pay. The Jewish, the totality of the reparation for that the Jewish had received is totally, is, I mean, currently, is will going like an apology, a billion, a billion will US dollars. Will an apology dollars. rest our souls? An apology will give, give you and I respect and honor. You understand? It's like when you, when you, when you have, when you, for instance, this is me. You have enough, you, you have a knife, knife behind me. Mm. You, you, you have a knife behind me. Now, to get the knife out wouldn't kill anything, wouldn't do anything. You know, getting the knife out wouldn't do anything. But healing the wound would be the most important thing for you to do. But now you have this element, they wouldn't even agree that they have a knife behind us. Beyond an apology, what other recommendations do you expect? Well, I, 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 take it, I, I would want, you know, but I, I would want international organizations. But when I speak about international organizations, I'm not speaking of UN, I'm not speaking of UNESCO, because those elements will never represent our interests. I'm talking about our brothers and sisters all over the world, you know, that, have, that belong to you know, Pan-Africanist-oriented organizations, to remain consistent in our demands for reparation, mm -hmm. in our demands for self-repair. For now, demands for us in, in the demand for us to work on ourselves. Now, demand for, for for our government to understand that they do not have they do not have the monopoly of demands. We also have what right to demands, and right to demands implies that we must make sure we remain consistent in our demand for self repair, self reparation, really building all our system, political system, economic system, you know, sociocultural systems that we had before the advent and of the we Arabs have and the Europeans. leave it here, Ifama Beru historian, a scholar, Pan-Africanists, and a bit angry. Thank you for your time on Africa this Thank week. Thank you for having me. <laughs> well, while slavery has been practiced for almost the whole of human existence and history, the vast numbers involved in slave trade across Africa has left a legacy that cannot be ignored. Beyond the excuse of slavery as a bane of underdevelopment on the continent, Africa must break free from the shackles of the past and contemplate the choices of the present to brighten the chances of the future. I have been your guide, Fadisha Lashwitsingwa. Many thanks for watching and bye for now.